welcome back troglodytes to the Troglies Guitar Show. Today we're reviewing my number one most recommended pick for somebody who's just starting out with Les Pauls. This one is a 1979 Gibson The Paul. Now this model is essentially the very first studio that Gibson made. Now, you can make the argument that the L6S, S1, and Marauder are kind of also precursors to the studio. However, this is the first one that had the body shape of a Les Paul completely and a set neck. The L6S is kind of like a flattened Les Paul, and the other two have bolt-on necks. So this is the first one that got the formula right. But why do I highly suggest these things? One, they are very cost friendly and cost effective. The only caveat to purchasing one of these is you have to have the original pickups in here. Now, if the wiring has been played with, you got a different bridge, different tuners, no big deal, but you have to have the pickups because stock, these have T-top pickups. That's the exact same stuff that's in a Les Paul Custom. In fact, stock, this guitar is just like a Les Paul Custom because it has the same electronics as well as the pickups. The bridge and tailpiece are the same. The tuners are different, but some people actually might prefer these Grovers to the Schallers. But some of these actually did get the Schallers as well. So you can pick these up usually for around a thousand bucks, sometimes a little less depending on condition. So compare this $1,000 range guitar to a Les Paul Custom, which ranges from $2,000 to $3,500. It almost seems like the deal is just too good to be true. So what is actually different about this guitar? Well, this is a pure walnut body. This particular one is a three-piece walnut body and a three-piece walnut neck. So for Tonewood traditionalists, uh, if you hear walnut, you're probably going to be scared away, but please do not be. Now, if you can't get past these things being made of walnut, in the early 80s, they rebranded these to be called Firebrands, and they made a deluxe model that was all mahogany. Now, I've had one of each, and maybe it's just because I had the walnut model before the mahogany one, but I actually prefer the walnut ones. There's just something beautifully plain about them, and these tend to have a satin finish, whereas those deluxe ones, they'll either have an exotic finish on it, like a solid color, or they have a really glossy finish over them. And then there was also a similar guitar called a VSG, which was all walnut, and also was rebranded as the SG Fire brand. And then there's the little known 335S, which is kind of like a solid body version of a 335. So when you're looking for one of these, you can usually find them either by their original title, The Paul or The SG, or just simply Firebrand. Now they called the new ones the Firebrand series because they actually branded the headstock in that manner. That is the one piece of Gibson collectible history that I think I would like to own, the actual fire branding stick. I've never seen one for sale, but I did see an advert with one of those. In fact, I happen to have one of those flyers right here. This was an original magazine print ad for these guitars, and here you can see that stick I'm talking about. I would love to find one of those. I think it's just kind of a cool piece of history. They aren't exactly beautiful guitars to most people, but you can find some really nice examples like this one that have great wood grain. I mean, look at the grainage on the back here. It is such a beautiful example. Some of these are really, really plain and not very pretty, but these are the ones that I always like to buy when they have some nice light figuring to them as well as great wood grain. But above all else, these things just play fantastic and they sound just like a Les Paul Custom. One of these days I'll get a Norlin Era Custom and one of these together in a room and do a shootout match between the two. But as far as I see it, I think these things are almost superior in playability simply because you're not as scared to damage these things. If you're looking for a new guitar, hunt one of these out that still has the original pickups and look for wear and tear like this. 
finish worn off the neck, lots of bumps and bruises, because these are great indicators that this is a fantastic playing example. I always am surprised when I get one of these because they're just fantastic playing. I had a great time playing this one. I learned some new riffs and it, it just kept inspiring me to play more. I wasn't scared to really hammer into this one because, well, it's already got some dings and scratches anyways. And honestly, a little bit of character buildup on this isn't going to hurt the value at all. Here's the other kicker for these things. They still have an ebony fretboard. So technically, if you get a deluxe version of one of these that's all mahogany, you have the exact same woods, the exact same pickups and electronics as a Les Paul Custom. You're just missing the binding along the body as well as the neck. And these are slightly thinner guitars compared to that. But that usually makes these guitars fairly lightweight. We're talking like that 9 to 10 pound range, which is pretty good for a 70s, 80s Les Paul. Now this one has a common modification. Somebody put a pick guard on it. These didn't come stock with pick guards. In fact, somebody just straight up drilled it into the top. There is no pick guard bracket or anything. Another modification is Schaller strap locks on this one. It appears somebody experimented with different pickups because the soldering work is not original in here. I believe the jack has also been replaced. However, these are still the original T-tops that were put back in. And the only other non-original part on here is it looks like the nut has been replaced at one point in time. So once again, I do highly suggest these the Paul and Fire brand guitars simply because they're great workhorse guitars. They're also great for somebody who's new into like 70s and 80s Les Pauls. These are a great gateway guitar. These are also a perfect first guitar. If your son or daughter wants to learn, buy one of these. I can't stress this enough. This guitar holds value. It's never really gonna go down. So if you hand them one of this, they play it around. If they don't end up sticking with the guitar, you can always sell it because these are a hot cake item. You list them, they sell. You list them, they sell. I actually had four of these and I was a little bit scared about how I would review four of the exact same guitar back to back but I just ended up selling some of those off to like Chicago Music Exchange and other people who were looking for them. So this was actually already my last one, but I wanted to make sure I at least got one of them reviewed because it's been a while since I've had the opportunity to share one of these with my channel. So yes, definitely buy one of these because they're just fantastic. <laughs> Now that we know how this rocking guitar sounds, let's go ahead and go over the condition of this one. These are the ones you want, the ones that got players wear on them. Here you can see there's lots of scratches and some edge wear to this one, including a very small chip off the headstock around here. Very tiny, very minor, but it is there. And you do have a gold Gibson silkscreen logo. The truss rod cover reads the Paul, and again the nut has been replaced on this one. 
And there is a very tiny chip off the side of the headstock right here. You can see what happened. Something just dinged it right there and just happened to splinter the wood a little bit. Definitely nothing to worry about, but it is there and worth knowing about. The frets do show some player's wear, but this guitar plays just fine as is. You might want to consider a level recrown job in the next year or so. And there is some very light indentations into the ebony fretboard and the cowboy chord area. Now, since these are naturally a satin finish, over the years, if you play these things, they'll buff naturally into a gloss finish. And that's kind of what's going on right here. You'll feel it right here and it's like, oh, that's kind of satin. Then it's like, whoa, this is glossy. That happens because somebody's arm is constantly doing this, which naturally buffs the finish into this beautiful sheen. So you've got that in a few different areas on this guitar, but lots of light nicks and dings and scratches. You still have your original aged speed knobs on here. I do want to say that the three-way switch, uh, you could technically replace it. It works just fine up and down, but there is a little bit of a, a jiggle to it. So it's good to know, but it does still function. And again, there is the added pick guard, but the original T-tops, bridge, and tailpiece are still there. Now, before I forget here on the output jack plate, you are missing a screw and this screw is a replacement. And I actually had some difficulty with this output. It kept cutting in and out on me. So I was like, okay, is it a bad jack? But when I opened it, I figured out what was the issue. The braided wiring was actually touching the input and that caused the sound to get cut. So what I did is I just wrapped a little bit of electrical tape around there and that solved the issue completely. So if you're ever modifying this guitar and wonder why that's there, that's why. Leave it in place. Back of the headstock, our serial number is 739521, which makes this a very, very, very early 1979. It was made on the third day of the year. Now, once again, you've got some edge wear, but nothing too out of the ordinary. Original Grovers are still on this one yet. And you're gonna notice, hey, there's no Made in USA stamp on this guitar. That's not true. It is there if we get it in the light just right. But honestly, the only part you can really see is like the made part of Made in USA. But it is there. This is actually fairly common on these Norland era Gibsons where the stamp didn't get pressed in enough. Something happened at the factory. Now, if this had a full colored finish over it, you probably wouldn't be able to see it at all. But it is there, rest assured. You do have some stand rash along the edges of the headstock, but nothing too major. And once again, that very small ding along the edge here. But no actual breaks, cracks, or repairs, and you do have a volute. Now it's kind of hard to see, but you do have some of that clear coat worn off the neck. But honestly, it's a really smooth transition, and it makes this guitar play really well. I personally really like the feel of these worn down necks, but I hate the look of them. This one's kind of the best of both worlds because I didn't even notice it until I started taking photos and I was like, oh, I guess there is some of that worn off, but we'll see this more clearly during the blacklight test. Now the back of the guitar. You've got some buckle worming and average wear and tear, but nothing too extreme here. I mean, the best part about this guitar is the back. You've got all this beautiful wood grain here. And that's what makes this particular example awesome. Not every example has these intricate patterns. I really like this centerpiece right there. Something else that makes these fantastic is the comfort cutaway. This makes it really nice to play this guitar because you don't have sharp edges digging into you like binding can do for some players. These are also great modding platforms. A lot of people will refinish these into their dream guitars because they are great starting points. Just average light wear and tear along the edges of the guitar. Again, Schaller strap buttons instead of the originals, but no big deal there. Now we'll do a black light test. As you can see, the headstock is looking good, glowing that ghostly green color that we would expect to see, as does the body and the knobs, and surprisingly the pickup rings as well. These don't always glow, but sometimes they do. Back of the headstock, this shows us there are no actual breaks, cracks, or repairs here. You can see where the wood splintered off a little bit. But here's where you can see all the wear on the neck. 
you can see where the clear coat has been worn off and it looks like you got a little bit of stand rash here so it's definitely a well-worn in guitar the back is also looking fantastic as far as the black light test is concerned and the sides you've got some light wear and tear along the edges and the clear coat but besides that again fantastic example now this guitar comes in an aftermarket hard shell case. This one is a chroma cast case. I am very impressed with this case. I mean, you've only got three latches, but there is a fourth one on the back. But I've got to say, if I ever need a Les Paul case, this is definitely one I would go for. It is a fantastic case as far as aftermarkets go. The problem with most aftermarket cases is the guitar slides around a lot. They'll go whoosh, they go up and down, side to side. It's not a good fit. Yes, it's a hard shell case, but it's not a good one. But this one, that's a really tight fit. I would almost say it's better than a Gibson case as far as the fit goes. The only thing that's wrong with this case is there's not a double neck rest. But as far as the fit here, up and down, secure. Side to side, secure. Nice and plush. This really is a fantastic case. If you think you might be interested in being the next owner of this The Paul, feel free to contact me on my Facebook page, facebook.com slash troglys, T-R-O-G-L-Y-S. You can also click on the link in the description to take you to the listing. Thank you, Troll Dice, for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will see you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care. <laughs>